Denmark has yeah quite ambitious targets. I think by maybe 2035 or something like that, they're looking to have 100% renewable gas. So there there are good examples in Europe, and I know like people often lament that you know Ireland has been slow to develop in terms of this industry, but I think you know it's also fortuitous in a way because we can learn from other countries and we can see what worked and what didn't work. Hello, I'm Cahill Summers, and I'm Georgia Glenn your Chagas Sustainability Advisors. And you're welcome to the Chagas Environmental Edge podcast number 63, bringing you the latest information, science, opinion to prove farm sustainability. Is energy farming a possibility in the future? Would it push globally to replace fossil fuels? With land use change high on the agenda, could farmers grow crops and grass to produce energy? Is anaerobic digestion part of the solution? Chagas researcher, Dr. Kira Bazang, joins us to discuss the process and her work in setting up an anaerobic digester in Grange. Kira, you're very welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. The anaerobic digestion plant in Grange is a pilot project. What was the driving force behind the Kira and its construction? Yeah, so I suppose going back to the time of the previous director of Chagas, uh, Professor uh, Jerry Boyle, there was a recognition that uh, there was an opportunity, I suppose, for anaerobic digestion for Irish agriculture. Um, and I suppose also a, a recognition that, you know, there is a need to be able to demonstrate what that might look like in an Irish context um, using agricultural feedstocks. So I suppose in terms of the industry, anaerobic digestion, it's a little bit underdeveloped in Ireland compared to some other European countries, you know, the likes of Germany or the UK, for the example. Um, but, you know, there, there's been a great deal of interest over the last couple, couple of years in the potential of the industry. And I suppose now we're really getting to a point where it's, you know, about to kick off, I think, in terms of the potential um, to develop it in, in Ireland. We're importing a huge amount of gas into the country, aren't we, currently as well, Kira? So it's not very sustainable. Yeah, that's exactly it. So I suppose there there are a number of, you know, concerns in terms of our, our energy security, and that will be one of them, our dependence on fossil fuels, first of all, and also fossil fuels that are imported into the country. And I suppose that became quite evident, you know, with the war in Ukraine um, and energy prices. So I suppose there's great interest in looking at what kind of resources do we have domestically in Ireland that we could use to produce our own indigenous renewable energy. And anaerobic digestion could be a technology that would be useful in, in, in that case. It's important, actually, because you, you mentioned the war in Ukraine and the, the lack of power of not being able to turn on and off your own tap for, for a source of heating is a huge thing, isn't it? Yeah, it is indeed. And, um, you know, I suppose the war, you know, highlighted that quite clearly. And again, particularly in, in terms of, you know, our reliance on importing um, fossil gas, um, it's 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 quite important that we look to other opportunities to diversify. So we're, we're not relying on, you know, like one one source of energy or, or one type of energy um, in our systems. Um, anaerobic digestion, right? Um, lots of farmers have always come up to me over the years, especially when they hear that you're a sustainability advisor, even though we mainly focus on water quality. But I think everyone is aware of the term, but I don't know if people are really aware of what it actually is. Can, can you describe what is anaerobic digestion? Yeah, sure. So even if we take the, the two words anaerobic digestion, so anaerobic means without oxygen and then digestion means, you know, the breakdown of organic matter by different uh, microorganisms and bacteria. So that's what's happening if we have a anaerobic digester or an AD plant. It's a closed vessel. And we add a source of organic material. So we might look at something like animal slurries or manures or grass silage or something like food waste. And we add that to our vessel. And then what happens in in the reactor or the vessel is we have the breakdown of that material by the different groups of bacteria. And I suppose the products that we have arriving from that is biogas. Um, And that has potential as as a source of energy. It can be upgraded. So we take away the carbon dioxide that's in the gas and we're left with methane. So that's the same um, constituent as fossil gas. And that can be used to directly substitute fossil gas in the grid. Um, so, yeah, it's it's a really interesting reaction, I suppose. You know, it's we're basically recreating what happens in the rumen and then we're capturing that methane and exploiting it in, in, in different pathways. What t- what type of product can you feed that that rea- or that, that system with? 
Yeah, that's a good question. So as I've mentioned, you know, things like animal slurries and manures, um, grass silage, energy crops would be commonly used in Europe, like the likes of maize. Um, food waste would also be quite commonly used. And I suppose it's also often used um, for wastewater treatment. So many was wastewater treatment plants would use anaerobic digestion to treat the sludge um, and capture some of the methane from that process. So it's basically different kinds of organic matter that bacteria would like to break down in that kind of closed environment. So we wouldn't really be able to use things like kind of woody biomass that wouldn't be suitable for anaerobic digestion. And we'll say with the likes of food waste, it would be quite important that there wouldn't be any contamination or impurities or things like plastic and things like that. The the digester is quite a sensitive vessel, so we have to be quite careful that we're keeping the bugs happy with whatever we're feeding into the digester. Just one question on the bugs, actually. Um, where do you get the bugs from? Or are they naturally occurring in the product? So they, they would generally be naturally occurring in the product, but I suppose when we're starting a biogas plant or an AD plant from the beginning, it would be quite common to inoculate the plant with a, a source of bacteria. So most commonly that would be from another biogas plant. So we're able to supply the plant with the kind of, you know, a good source of the bacteria that are, that are common in the plant. And that just kickstarts the reaction and it enables us to produce the gas more quickly than if we were to just leave it like not inoculated. Kira, why are fertilizer inputs and spore type used in silage production so important in the sustainability of biogas production? That's a really great question, Deirdre. I'm, I'm glad you asked it. So obviously, when we're, we're talking about biomethane, it's a biofuel. And while we want to make sure that it can be counted as a, a renewable energy when we're looking at our targets under the Renewable Energy Directive, so in order to do that, we need to look at the emissions that are associated with producing that biomethane. And we compare it then to fossil fuel comparators. So fossil fuels that would be used in heat and transport. So we look at the life cycle production of producing biomethane. And in particular, we're interested in looking at grass silage because um, in, in an Irish context, grass silage is one of the feedstocks that would be you know, the most abundant and have the most um, potential to produce biomethane and, and reach our targets. So we wanted to see, can we produce biomethane with grass silage and can account towards our renewable energy targets. And I suppose one of the kind of hot spots in terms of the grass silage biomethane and its production would be fertilizer. So if we're using synthetic fertilizer, that would drive up the emissions associated with the production and it wouldn't necessarily meet the sustainability criteria. So we were doing a little bit of research in Chagas Grange, looking at the ability of different sward types to meet the sustainability criteria. So your standard perennial ryegrass sward, that would be receiving 120 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. And we also looked at two other sward types. So looking at a, a ryegrass and red clover mix, and that wouldn't have been receiving any inorganic nitrogen. And then also looking at a multi-species sward. So that would have, uh, I think, six different species in the mix. And the I suppose the data that we were using for that and the yields would have been work done by Thomas Maloney and Grange for his PhD a number of years ago. And what we found is that when we have the, the red clover and the legumes included in the swords, that helps us to achieve a really good yield with minimum or zero inorganic fertilizer. And by using these types of swords for our biomethane production, it enables us to meet the sustainability criteria so we can count that as a renewable fuel for our renewable targets. Um, is there another byproduct then of the process? And so what can you do with it? Yeah, absolutely. So the solid fraction that's remaining um, from the anaerobic digestion process, that's known as digestate. And it's a really valuable fertilizer. So about 80% of the, the volume of the feedstocks um, that we supply into the digester, that's retained as a solid fraction, which is the digestate. And I think that's an area that we're really interested in exploring in, in Chagas in terms of how can we valorize that digestate and uh, make sure that we can use it in, in the best possible way. So all of the nutrients are retained in, in the digestate um, and, you know, there's good opportunity to use it in, in different ways. So we might look at separating it into a solid and liquid fraction and see where those fractions would be best applied back out onto the land. Kira, you mentioned 80% of, of the grass or whatever goes into, into uh, the system is actually recovered in the byproduct, but how much grass or how much crop does it take to run one of them systems? I know it probably depends on the size of the daily plant, but does it take a lot of 
of of products. Yeah, so I, I can give you an indication for the, the pilot plant that we have here in Grange. So we're going to be uh, digesting grass silage and cattle slurry. So we'd be looking at feeding the digester around um, nine tons of cattle slurry per day and about 14 tons of grass silage. Um, so I think that would be uh, about 70 hectares worth of silage and it would be the slurry from about a thousand cattle. Um, so it kind of gives you an indication like there's there's quite a good amount of feedstock involved in the running of these plants. And even the Chagask plant would be sort of considered small compared to maybe some of the commercial plants that are being proposed for the 2030 uh, target. Um, so certainly, you know, if we're if we're going towards larger plant sizes, what we would see happening would be sort of cooperative systems or centralized systems where a number of farmers would be feeding into the larger plants to supply the feedstock. So it's a de- and that's you'll be topping that up every day then with, with with food or grass going into it, and I suppose that goes to another question. I don't know. If, feel free not to answer this, but that that I suppose that's grassland which will be in competition maybe with beef or dairy or sheep farmers for the same ground. So I presume the price will have to be decent enough and potentially a, a significant change in land use. I presume. So I suppose the first part of that in terms of, you know, the, the competition for, for feedstock and, you know, where is this going to come from? Um, like in terms of the, you know, we're looking at a target of 5.7 terawatt hours of, of biomethane by 2030. So that would be the equivalent of about, te- of about 10% of our current gas demand. Um, and in terms of the you know, area for grassland, in order to meet that target, we'd be looking at something in around 150,000 hectares of grassland. So I think that would constitute about 3% of the current agricultural land. So that's that's a quite small in that context. And I suppose we also need to think about how is that grass going to be produced? So I suppose previously we might have thought about intensification where we'd add more nitrogen, inorganic nitrogen fertilizer into that system and increase the yield. But obviously that's not the, the sustainable approach. So there's a number of alternatives so I suppose the first thing would be maybe bringing up the yield on some of our existing grassland. And I know there's very good work with the Grass 10 campaign that Chagas have done. So we can look to, you know, increasing the yield on maybe some of the land where it's not currently, you know, reach, reaching its full potential. And I suppose another way that we can think about supplying that feedstock is looking at it in terms of diversification. So giving farmers a, an alternative use for their land. And I suppose diversification is one of the main kind of ways that we're looking at reducing our emissions in the agriculture sector. That's recognised in the Climate Action Plan for 2023. And it's also recognised in the Chagas Climate Strategy. So diversification could be a number of different land uses, the likes of forestry, organic farming, tillage, and also the feedstocks for anaerobic digestion. So, and, and you know, it may be the case that a farmer might just go give over a small portion of their land to diversify and grow some of that feedstock and doing it sustainably with the likes of our, our red clover mixes or with a multi-species sward. So I think that's that's kind of the way that we're thinking about how is this going to fit in the current system for Irish agriculture and how is it going to work for farmers? And I suppose that's, again, a very important point that you've raised, Cahill, in terms of, you know, what's the price going to be for that feedstock? Because, you know, it needs to be an attractive option for farmers you know if they're going to change their land use and supply this feedstock and I suppose that that will come with time as you know the plants are, are constructed and you know the contracts are put in place I think there's going to have to be you know some stability there in terms of the length of the contracts that are offered and I suppose what we also need to think about is the quality of the silage that's being produced I think farmers it, it, the, the reward that farmers get it'll have to be recognized in terms of the quality of silage that they're producing so it might not necessarily you know be being paid on a ton of grass silage it might be based on you know the dry matter or other kind of parameters that indicate the quality of that silage I suppose that's something that we'd like to do a little bit of work in to see how can you know the the price best reflect the quality of the products that the farmer is producing so that they're getting a fair share in terms of the industry and what they're providing. So as dry stock farming at the moment, margins are so tight that there is an opportunity there for them to maybe or some of them to um, farm the energy farmers in the future. Mm, absolutely. And I think it's it's just about thinking it about, you know, in terms of flexibility that, you know, it'll be an option that's there for farmers. 
Um, it's a relatively small amount of, of land that will be required. So not every farmer is necessarily going to have to change, but it does just give that flexibility and it might be quite attractive and, and as an alternative income stream, um, just as an option for them to diversify. There's, uh, there's great incentives, I think, in Northern Ireland for farmers as well, you know, that, you know, provide grass for the grid through the AD plants. Um, that's possibly not available here in Ireland at the moment. Yeah, so certainly, I suppose, what we've seen in other countries um, across Europe and, and again in the likes of Northern Ireland um, is that really the industry has been kind of kickstarted by having some kind of financial support, be that a feed-in tariff, which they would have had in Northern Ireland, or maybe the likes of some kind of capital grant for the building of the plants. So currently, there's a, a national biomethane strategy that's being developed. So that's... Um, uh, jointly between the Department of Agriculture and the Department of um, Environment and, and Climate and Communications. So I think hopefully the strategy might provide some uh, indication of, you know, what the model is going to be in Ireland and how are we going to reach the quite ambitious target that's been put forward for 2030. Um, I suppose we also do have a renewable heat obligation that will come into play in 2024. So there's quite a lot of developments happening at the moment. And I suppose, you know, we'll we'll ha- we'll know quite soon, you know, the pathway that's going to be there for the industry to develop. Are there limitations or challenges in Ireland in relation to AD? I think probably from what I've just mentioned, you know, kind of the clarity in terms of the policy landscape and, you know, the, the financial incentives. I think that's where, you know, there has been uncertainty up until now. And I think that's where people are possibly waiting to see, you know, what, what the, the national strategy will bring. And hopefully that will kind of, I suppose, kickstart the industry and give some clarity in terms of, you know, the opportunity that's going to be there to incentivize the production of biomethane in, in Ireland. I think that's kind of what the, the main challenge has been to date. I think we've learnings for countries like Denmark in particular. I think something like 90% of their gas produced is from AD plants. Yeah, D- Denmark has yeah, quite ambitious targets. I think like quite soon, I think it's by maybe... 2035 or something like that they're looking to have 100 percent renewable gas um so there there are good examples in europe and i know like people often lament that you know ireland has been slow to develop in terms of this industry but i think you know it's also fortuitous in a way because we can learn from other countries and we can see what worked and what didn't work and you know it we, the, the way the industry develops it might be different to what we've seen in europe because it'll have to work in an irish context so i think there's plenty of learnings there and um you know, we can really build on, on that in, in Ireland. I think that's important, actually, that a lot of research is out there. and But we have to look at it in, in an Irish context, which you're doing at, in Grange at the moment. And what's really good is we, we can capitalise on mistakes made in the past where we can make it work better for ourselves. Where are you at the moment with the progress in the planting range? Yeah, so the, the, the plant in Grange is in the, the final stages of commissioning. Um and I suppose it's interesting, again, thinking about, you know, the pathways that we've taken in, in Europe compared to Ireland. I suppose originally the plan for the plant in Grange would have been to use it for CHP, so for combined heat and power to produce electricity. And that would have been very much what was happening on the continent in Europe in the last 10 years. Um, whereas things have changed a little bit now and now there's more interest in using the biogas and upgrading it to biomethane. So that's the plan for the, the plant here. So we'll be able to upgrade it to have it the same standard as fossil gas and then that can be used in the gas grid um so you know the the site in grange is going to be really important i think as a demonstration site to the best of my knowledge we don't have any examples in in ireland of plants that are digesting grass silage and cattle slurry like we're proposing and i think it's going to be important for people to be able to see what that looks like how it's operating you know what are kind of the results that we're getting and equally, we don't currently have any examples of, you know, farmers who are producing the types of feedstock that we're proposing to supply supply these plants. So, again, I think that's going to be really important that we can demonstrate the sustainable production of these feedstocks, the, the grass silage produced with red clover, and looking at how we can use the digestate, how that's going to be incorporated back into the land and used sustainably. So, you know, that's probably another challenge. Like, you know, there's there's probably a little bit of a gap in knowledge there that we, we can't really show it yet, but that's what our ambition is to do in Grange, to be able to show people this is the, the vision we have for agricultural feedstocks and this is how it can be done sustainably. 
Kira, look, I, we're going to be following and looking at, with great interest with what's going on in Grange because I think it's a really exciting area to work in and a lot of farmers do as well. And I suppose with what we have to work with, with our environmental challenges and land use change, this is another attractive offer, hopefully, that will come across farmers' gates. So just like to thank you very much for joining us on the show and best luck with your work in the future. Thank you very much. That's it for this episode of the Chagas Environment Edge. Thanks to Chagas Researcher Officer Dr. Kira Bazang for joining us on the show. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe to the podcast. You can listen on Apple and Google Podcasts as well as Spotify. And for more information, go to the Chagas website at chagas.ie. I'm Carl Summers. And I'm Georgia Glenn. Join us next time for the Chagas Environment Edge podcast, signpost to farm sustainability.